The UWF, I think it did the second second highest rating of any Dark Side of the Ring this week. So it was a big hit. I have some questions for you related to that, but maybe since you're the expert on it, maybe you could just take us through from start to finish your story of it, um, of what you feel like sharing. And then if you don't answer some of the questions I have for you in it, I'll ask you at the end. Okay, your audience is going to get a real treat because I didn't have time to do this on Dark Side of the Ring um, because there's three people, uh, you know, you have three, four people, four characters and back and forth due to time constraints. But I met Herb Abrams um, um, somewhere on somewhere I was um, on the uh, West Coast. I met Herb and it was after... It was around 1990, and um, he told me he was doing the UWF, and he wanted me to be a big part of that. So we talked about money, and the money was right, and um, Herb had owned some uh, clothing companies. He had a big and tall store. He had a woman's uh, uh, store for heavier women. Um with very nice clothing and he was successful in that business and he even had a partner I can't remember his name at one time that helped him with the UWF start the formation of it and uh, I went to Reseda California worked uh, had some you know the, even though the place is only held uh, what 400 people they were packed and so the audience was hot it was live uh, I decided to um, to create uh, a character, a valet for myself, uh, which happened to be my wife, Tony, and um, um, she uh, she uh, became my valet and dressed in, uh, she, we called her Honey, and I used to bale hay with my grandfather, some wonderful stories of my grandfather in Arkansas, and we, he had usually three to four hundred head of cattle, and we'd round them up on horses, and we had these cattle prongs. And they'd have six double D batteries in them, and they'd shock the pee out of those cattle. And they'd go wherever you want them to go, because you had to get them into a chute to give them shots, warm them, and spray them uh, for flies. And uh, so I had always remembered that cattle prong, and I thought, well, what a great gimmick. So I told you I like visual aids. So this was the uh, original Stinger cattle prong. Uh, you can see the, uh, I don't have any batter batteries in it right now, or you can see the arc uh, light up. You know, <laughs> the batteries go in here, and you, it's got a safety on it, just like a gun, because it'll, it'll light you up. So um, I, uh, <laughs> we had a finish, you know, I did it with Spivey and Orton, or something had happened, you know, they'd do something dirty and dastardly to me, and honey would reach in and sting them you know um maybe i'd make a comeback boom all of a sudden they stop me and uh do something really nasty um about to pin me or something and honey would reach in and press the button and sting them and they'd go crazy and of course there's no batteries in it so one time i thought she was going to catch me but i i snuck the batteries in there and i put the batteries in there and so uh working with Bob Orton and I, I didn't know what was going to happen and I've never been shocked by one of those and didn't even want to test it you know so I mean if it moves a bull it's, it's got to hurt pretty bad so <laughs> she reaches up and presses that button because I always told her you make you, it's a shoot you know you're working a shoot you're always working a shoot you know that's what I was always taught you know you're working a shoot I mean it's got a if the fans don't believe it, then, you know, you don't have the luxury of, uh, of angles and television cameras. I mean, you got to lay it in. And so I give her the, so she pressed the button. To hold, I said, hold it like you're, you know, shaking it and everything. Like it's moving your arm. So I put those batteries in there and all of a sudden the finish comes. I hear her go, oh my gosh, the loudest scream I ever heard. And he goes, gee, and he's going, ah, you know, and that Bob Orton thing, and the way he puts his arms up, ah, 
And so it was a it was a shoot, you know, and he's going, God damn, you know, duh, 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 duh. excuse my friend. So I hate that word. Uh, but uh, he was really upset <laughs> just for a minute. And uh, anyway, uh, finish goes and she was so upset. Oh, my gosh, because he, he was looking at her like she did it, you know, on purpose. Um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, not long after that, she decided she had enough of the wrestling business and, so how did you end up becoming booker of that company? Was that from the start when he recruited you? He wanted your mind to help him develop angles? Yeah, he needed that and some talent and some things like that. And, uh, you know, I just uh, didn't want, uh, I mean, I booked in Oklahoma. And, um, you know, did, did uh, a lot of uh, creative things, but... Um, he uh, um, he wanted somebody that had talent connections too, and somebody that the guys kind of respected. And so uh, I got a lot of the talent there for him. And he uh, um, was running out of money, and started um, bouncing some checks. But prior to that, we he came to Tampa a lot. He loved to come to Tampa because there was lots of hookers and lots of cocaine in Tampa. And that was Herbie's favorite thing. You put him in a pair of cowboy boots and uh, give him some cocaine and a hooker, and he's that's his end all do all. And so he, uh, uh, we would go to eat at a place called Donatello's. Um, I had a friend named Ed Barbara who was a really good golfer, and he, um, uh, was also a wrestling fan and enjoyed the uh, the industry quite a bit. And so he would come to dinners, and Ed had a friend named Tom Kenny. Well, Tom Kenny uh, owned a switching company called CMI. And what they did is they bought minutes. He lived in Atlanta, and they bought minutes from MCI. Remember the phone company, MCI? Yeah. He would package minutes and... Uh, sell them at a discounted, he'd buy them at a discounted rate and sell them at a, a cheaper rate than AT&T and the other companies. Um, so he was making a ton of money. And his brother was the accountant who was the super fan. Big, I mean, the biggest wrestling fan I've ever seen in my life. And he was the accountant. And so we would have these big dinners in Donatello's. It became like a little hangout for everybody, you know, they'd fly in and... Um, it was Lear Jets and limousines, and uh, Herbie decided somehow, I guess, um, well, uh, Tom Kenny has a golf tournament. This, uh, the reason I got to know Tom better is Ed said um, that uh, there was a golf tournament at Horseshoe Bend Country Club in Atlanta, and that um, everybody was going to fly in and play golf for a charity. So I'm not the best golfer in the world, but I can golf. You know, I have wonderful times with a uh, great story with Undertaker and Brian Adams, um, Dan Spivey. We were all golfing buddies, but um, uh, we used to always play bingo, bango, bongo. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but if, all the golfers know what bingo, bango, bongo is. And um, so we go to this Horseshoe Bend uh, tournament, and we go to the tournament. I cannot yeah. believe it. Ed, Ed's on fire. As a matter of fact, for another visual aid, just so you can verify the story here, here's our trophy. Uh, and it says, if you can read it, it says uh, 1991 uh, Horseshoe Bend Country Club. And uh, so we win the tournament. And um, Ed's real excited about that. And Ed's got a ton of money, too. And uh, Everybody heard, everybody winds up eating at Donatello's again. And this time, Tom brings his brother from the switching company. And Tom has a wonderful wife, Marsha, and uh, she's still alive. Tom passed, uh, God bless him. But uh, uh, we're all having a good time at uh, Donatello's restaurant in Tampa, one of the best Italian restaurants you'll ever eat at. And inside of uh, the restaurant and we're all at the tables and i can see herbie now going to work and we wind up 
everybody somehow winds up in Atlanta and he convinced Tom Kenny to, I don't know what the structure of the deal was, but I know that he wound up getting, I think it, he got $3 million in total, a million bucks at a time. And um, Tom didn't know about the last two, only his brother did. Tom was willing to throw a million bucks at it, not really caring whether, well, I'm sure he cared, but it wasn't like he wasn't going to be able to pay his uh, mortgage payment if he lost a million bucks. So um, Herb actually um, got to be really tight with the accountant brother. And so that's where the money started coming from to build the UWF, to get Andre, to get all the talent that he got, that he wound up getting. He was uh, John Tolos. What a, what a funny guy John Tolos was. Um, you know, again, he's he was, uh, you know, older and I'm like a young guy in front with some of the older guys that are there. But uh, there's a lot. He brought in a lot of the WWT, you know, Bam Bam Bigelow. Uh, he brought in uh, Scott, you know, Bigelow. And uh, he brought in a lot of the guys. How much would Andre have been in those days, just to stop you for a second, just ballpark for an appearance? Um, I would say he probably paid Andre um, ten or 15000 bucks for the time because he had, Vince had let him go, I guess. And, uh, you know, he came into that. Um, and um, so... Um, that's how UWF was funded. And, you know, then, of course, we had the pay-per-views. Um, let me see. You know, we had that. The, the, what is this? The Bash at the Beach or Beach Brawl? Beach Brawl. Beach Brawl. Yeah, we had uh, Bash at the Beach. Um, you know, and it got it got to be hot enough where, um, you know, the, the actual magazine started running articles about the UWF and... So it started getting popular. Then uh, Herb always wanted to be the uh, Vince McMahon Jr. You know, he wanted to be the Vince McMahon Jr. And he started the merchandising. And uh, he saw the commercials that we did for Vince. And so then he started his own, you know, T-shirts and merchandising and things like that. Um, so, uh, oh, uh, here's one of my all-time favorite early pictures that's uh gordon soley uh jack briscoe and i don't want anybody taking a picture of that copying it but it's gordon soley jack briscoe and uh myself on my couch after i bought the very house that i live in when i was 23 years old and uh, i think there's a couple beer bottles there so keep that out of there <laughs> so you know the we used to have a great time the guys would come over and uh, just have, have a super time, a super, super, super time. But he then, then he, he got Orndorff, he got McFoley, he got um, golly, so much talent. Um, Billy Jack Haynes, I guess. Yeah, Bob Orton Jr., Billy Jack Haynes. He got uh, Bruno San Martino. Then he got. Um, what do you think Bruno would have charged to be under contract, or would it have would it have been just appearances, or would it have been in uh, like a yearly deal? I don't. I don't really know. That was very private. Whatever he paid Bruno, I think uh, only Bruno. Bruno was a very strict business guy. What a, what a great, wonderful man Bruno San Martino was. When you got to know Bruno, if he liked you, uh, he would do anything for you, and he was just always a gentleman. And one of, one of my favorite things that anybody ever did for me was to sit down and tell me what I did wrong. Uh, nothing. People that fear criticism will fe be fearful all their life because if you don't accept good criticism, you can never improve. And guys like uh, the Briscoes and, and Bruno, and they would always put you over for some reason, but then they would come back and say, man, why don't you try it this way? Or why don't you maybe incorporate this? Or, you know, you know, you should uh, have more fire in your comeback or whatever their advice was. It was, it was always good advice. And, you know, you, you always want to listen to advice, whether you're going to use it or not. People, if they want to, if they want to explain something, they feel like they're helping you go ahead and listen. And if it helps you, it helps you. If it doesn't, 
be polite and let it go. So I was very fortunate to have a lot of good good guys around that knew that I liked to hear. And I would even go up and ask some of the older guys, you know, some of my seniors, w would you mind uh, sort of watching my match and, uh, you know, just tell me whatever you think and i would really really appreciate that and so i mean i'd go to an old timer you know bill watson's terry like territory like uh sweet hansen um old timer named sweet hansen and even though he didn't wrestle my style and he was different you know the older guys when they were kind of on their way out and they're hanging in you know they they really appreciate that when a, a young kid uh which i was at the time uh uh asked them you know, for some help. And I, w I would do that very often. And Bruno was just that, just that kind of guy, you know, like a father figure. <laughs> Funny stories with his son, David, some I can't repeat. But. <laughs> How would Bruno have gotten along with her? Because it seems like if he had any suspicions about those type of extracurricular activities, he wouldn't have been impressed. No, not at all. If Bruno had known Herb's lifestyle, which he didn't. Herb was always on his uh, best behavior around Bruno because Bruno didn't play around with drugs or hookers or he didn't want anything to do with that. And, um, you know, I, I'm i glad I stayed clear of all that. You know, unfortunately, I didn't need to get a hooker. <laughs> um, now, who decided where the events would take place? Because I guess there was one in Dakota some in California, some in Florida, some in the Carolinas, New York. It seems pretty random. Yeah, there was a lot of guys helping him. Lenny Dues, John uh, Arezzi. Um, a lot of guys were giving Herb advice. And so um, I don't know whether it was Lenny getting the towns, uh, Lenny Dues, uh, Drews, I always pronounce Lenny's last name wrong. Douge, I believe um, he was a producer for NBC. I mean, Lenny was a very bright guy. And um, I think that uh, Lenny helped Herb get the towns. Okay. Why do you think, like, for instance, the beach bash or beach brawl didn't draw as well as it could have? Was that just local promotion? Because it seems like with that kind of talent and Florida, for instance, was known as a big wrestling territory. You'd think the crowd would have been bigger. Well, I would say that, especially in the wrestling, well, in life, you know, wisdom, um, wisdom is perhaps the best virtue that you can have. Um, but wisdom isn't found among fools. And Herb was foolish in the wrestling business i again i don't like to talk about bad about the deceased but i would say it to his face and i did many times uh many times um because of his ego and um wanted to get juice on television as a promoter i said i you know i didn't want anything to do with that and uh but her had to do it you know and as long as my checks were clearing you know i, I didn't care i i saw that he was foolish with the wrestling industry and uh, you know again he uh, herb i said this on dark side of the ring herb started at the top really and worked himself down rather than a vince mcmahon jr that you know started somewhere in here or senior and you know uh, actually vince jr catapulted the you know from wrestlemania one look what he did so he built the really from the not from the ground up, but from, you know, a, a place down here into a billion dollar industry. Is there any angles that you produced in the days when you were booking for Herb that you're proud of? Mm, I never really thought about that, Devin, and there's none that uh, really stick out. But, um, you know, there was a couple times where we really... Uh, hit on all cylinders and um, and things were good. I mean, there we had some really really good house shows, some some excellent ones. I mean, Mick Foley, he didn't care if there were, he's the same way. He, Mick, Mick Foley didn't care if there was twenty people or uh, twenty thousand people. Uh, I don't think we had twenty thousand people in the UWF, but uh, 
uh, he would go work his fanny off all the time. <laughs> I'd always go, Mick, man, you're way up in the stands, you know, up in the stands and there's, it shows the audience, you know, that there's no, no audience there. And so that would bother me. But, you know, Mick marches to his own drummer and he didn't care, you know, and he got over by doing that. So, you know, what do I know? Uh, but from a television perspective, you know, when you're looking at the shoot, you really don't want to see empty seats. So when you, even though we had a great like ringside crowd, once you go past that, you know, you're seeing an empty building and you can look at it either way. You know, you can look at, at it mixed way or you can look at it my way uh, or the way my psychology. The which, company way really, because that reflects poorly on the company. Even if WWE did that, we all know the crowds these days. If someone went on to the hard camera side, they would get in a lot of shit, if not be fired. Exactly. Exactly. But, so for that MGM Grand, do you think that the building probably helped bring that event to the building just to get an event of that magnitude in the building? Um, you know, again, Herb had my Herb would either be rich or poor um the deals he worked out i was never part of that i i was never a part of uh you know putting together the uh major events and it, like i i told him i said don't go to palmetto florida for the pay-per-view i said it's it's in the middle of nowhere it's a gigantic building but you know you just by then the, the cocaine had got to his brain so much and it's not just the cocaine he was drinking uh um uh, scotch he'd have scotch he started drinking scotch and cocaine and, and then it got to be where he would take the xanax or the valiums or whatever to come down off the cocaine and uh, herb's mood and his everything started changing you know if he would have if he would have really listened to bright minds around him, I mean, we just went through the talent he had there. He could have picked every one of the guys' um, minds and gotten together and done group booking and really made a success out of um, the UWF, I think. Uh, but again, he was foolish in that sense. What was the first red flag for you? Because obviously when you first got into this venture with him, you didn't realize what you were dealing with from his uh, kind of mentally unstable personality. Um, my first red flag was um, we, were, we were in California and we were supposed to be at a, sh uh, he was supposed to, we were supposed to ride together to this show and he he wasn't there. I kept we're gonna be late to the show. We're gonna be late to the show. So I go and knock on his hotel room, and he's got freaking hookers and cocaine. And that's the first time I saw him with hookers and cocaine. And um, I said, "This is not right." And if he does this, I already know there's no businessman that's gonna survive doing things like this right here. And then some checks, a couple checks started bouncing. He bounced one to me. And I went off on him for that because I've never bounced a check to anybody. I remember having Gold's Gyms, having to parlay credit cards to pay my people, you know, before I, before they became so successful. But, um, you know, Herb, who, I, I believe in the analogy or the thought process is, you know, you got to crawl before you walk. You got to cry before you talk. And Herb just wanted to cut a promo um, before he learned to do either while he was running uh if you know what i'm saying is it true that he could have paid some of the wrestlers when he was out of money with cocaine did you ever hear any of those rumors no there's a few i could think of that he probably could have done that with but uh i never heard that he actually did that was there any wrestler when you were booking that territory that uh ever gave you any problems from a booking standpoint you know, we, we forgot to mention Dr. Death, Steve Williams. He, he was a, you know, um, uh, Brunzel and I became the, the UWF World Tag Team Champions. 
uh, Dr. Death Steve Williams uh, was the Universal Wrestling Heavyweight Champion. And, uh, you know, he was, Steve got a lot of life back in him with the UWF because, you know, after that stupid stuff with the boxing, um, uh, Steve just wasn't the same after that for a long time. But I, I really saw the life popping back into him and the enthusiasm. It's just a shame that, uh, you know, he got cancer. And for Herb's death, we heard a couple different versions on the show. What do you think is the most plausible version of how he actually passed away? I know how he passed away. Passed away in the back of a squad car uh, with his shirt unbuttoned, his long black socks on, a pair of boxing shorts covered in Vaseline, cocaine, and had a heart attack. And that's and he was buried after that. The body was put in the ground. It's the strangest thing, Devin, because I didn't hear about the funeral. I didn't hear about anything other than the police report. Bill Anderson, I guess, visited his grave or something that he told me the other day. So there is, I guess, a gravestone for him, at least. Yeah, I saw that on Dark Side of the Ring, you know, where somebody said, uh, and, it was, and it was very touching, Lenny was extremely touching, saying that I know if uh, Herb was alive that he would call me because Herb and Lenny were tighter than peanut butter and jelly. I kept Herb at a arm's length because of his lifestyle. And, of course, like, he probably had issues with uh, owing a lot of people money, too, so... He probably really didn't care if he lived or died too much towards the end. I don't think he really wanted to die, Devin, but um, I, Herb thought he was invincible, you know. I tell you what, he, Herb was the most affable guy that you could imagine. You know, you just picture a guy about five foot two in a pair of cowboy boots, uh, you know, with a, he's a stereotypical uh my mother's Jewish, so I can say this is a Jew um, with the hair all out and uh, uh, sticking straight out. And uh, anyway, uh, um, he, uh, oh, sorry about that. Uh, so he, he uh, I just had to turn that off. Uh, I'm surprised it's not the killer bees theme on there. <laughs> so uh, um, I'm sure that her, her uh, is buried right where his cemetery is. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, match videos, or news updates. Support us on Patreon.com for $1.99 a month to watch our full shoot interviews ad-free and help our channel grow. Follow us on Twitter at the Hannibal TV for instant updates.